The Alabama State Training School for Girls Campus in Chalkville was used for over 100 years, from its conception in 1909 until an EF3 tornado destroyed 11 of the buildings in 2012. Stories emerged from the 90s and early 2000s detailing mental, physical, and sexual abuse inflicted on the girls by staff members and guards. After this information went public, Chalkville suspended 11 of its 15 staff members and hired a new administrator. Although federal lawsuits had been filed against the Alabama Department of Youth Services since 2001, it wasn't until 2007 that a $12.5 million settlement was made with the 49 plaintiffs. My name is Luke Schlaughter, I'm the owner of DeepSouthUrbex.com, and I made a post to my website on January 23rd, 2020 with over 100 photos of the remaining four buildings on the property, the administration building, the serving kitchen and dorms, the chapel, and the main dorm building slash clinic. Today, I return my focus to the Chalkville campus in an effort to tell its horrifying true story. Amy Singer of the Columbia University Journalism School investigated the claims of assault and sexual abuse in her 2002 Marie Claire magazine story, Girl Sentenced to Abuse. From the outside, Alabama's only state juvenile institution for girls might be mistaken for a prim private day school. Set far off the road in a wooded middle-class Birmingham suburb, the beige stone buildings create a tidy enclave that blends in nicely with the nearby churches and shops. There are no guard towers, no menacing barbed wire fences. Even the facility's welcome booklet, distributed to the troubled teenagers who are sent here to the Alabama Youth Services Chalkville campus, has a cheery tone. The girls are referred to as students, the guards are called staff members. We, the staff, are going to provide an opportunity and environment for you to gain effective control over your life. All the staff wants to do is help you. The teens, sent here by family court judges for things like truancy, shoplifting, and drug possession, are in desperate need of such caring guidance. Yet, at least 100 Chalkville girls charged they got no such thing. They allege that between January 1993 and June 2001, they were viciously mistreated. Since June of last year, 40 of those teenagers have filed federal lawsuits against the state's Department of Youth Services, its administrators, and several guards. The suits contend that, among other things, the girls were sexually assaulted, strip-searched by male guards, beaten, capriciously tossed into solitary confinement, denied medical attention, pressured to have abortions, and threatened with retaliation if they complained. Take the case of Sandy Jones. Until recently, the nervous 19-year-old couldn't bear to tell even her own mother about what had happened to her. After entering Chalkville five years ago for being expelled from school and running away from home, she says a guard came into her room one night with a proposition. He said if I had sex with him, I could get out of the facility early. The offer wasn't a complete shock. Sandy had already heard that Chalkville guards offered such bargains and that many students traded sexual favors for small pleasures, such as snacks and cigarettes. Desperate to visit her terminally ill grandmother, Sandy agreed to sleep with the guard. I had sex with him, she says, but I didn't want to. According to the Beham Wiki in a 1948 newspaper clipping from the Birmingham News, Matsuyuma was the name of insurance executive and real estate developer Lewis Clark's country estate near Chalkville. Clark sold the property to the state of Alabama at a steep discount in 1918. In 1937, five buildings were constructed by the Works Progress Administration as part of FDR's New Deal, including at least two of the buildings still standing. The estimated federal cost was $180,000, approximately $3.25 million in 2020 with inflation. The WPA took photos of the buildings in 1938, which are complete with captions like, This is the most modern school of its type in the country. The stone was cut from a nearby quarry. The clock was taken from the old courthouse building in Birmingham. The 1948 Birmingham News article also sings praises for Chalkville, claiming that all Alabama can well be proud of the beautiful campus and fine buildings of the state training school for girls. As suburban development gradually surrounds the abandoned campus, middle class residents will eventually take issue with its status and accessibility. You have to park in front of a gate and walk a fair distance to the buildings, but there isn't any form of posted no trespassing or private property sign encouraging vandals not to enter. The state's failure to secure this property after it was deemed unsafe post-tornado has ultimately resulted in its rapid decay. In 1974, Superintendent Eileen Slack expressed her discontentment with the facility's operations and called for updating the programs for delinquent girls in an academic journal called Criminal Justice and Behavior. 
Among the hundred girls who live with me on the campus of the Alabama State Training School for Girls in Chalkville, and among the hundreds of young persons with problems, not problem children, with whom I have worked for more than 20 years, most have had worse things done to them than will ever do to anyone else. For the most part, adult evils and frustrations have been lowered with vengeance upon them. Many of the young women at the state school have had more fearful experiences and have faced more rejection by their 18th birthday than each of us will ever know in our entire lives. Because of this, these young adults often are filled with self-hatred and feel worthless. They have indeed been pushed beyond their thresholds of control and they act accordingly. Many young women at our state training school are trying to get the staff and other girls to reject them as most other adults and peers have done in the past. Behind the words of a girl who shouts into my office, I hate you Dr. Slack, you make me sick. Behind the punch I receive now and again in my side when one of them is trying to make a point. Behind a girl's hostility, adult hating mannerisms, sullenness, and her tough broad swagger, there exists more indications of sincerity, more real strengths, more adaptability and survival mechanisms than we give her credit for. One can't help but wonder how this young woman has learned to cope as well as she has in an environment that seems to elicit failure and the destruction of the individual. In working with young adults, we must be realistic and alert to the wrongs which have affected these students, and we have to be candid about our problems and our shortcomings in helping them. But the question persists. It arises again and again. How can any of us go about the job of reaching out to these youths? Just a shocking side note, but following her departure from Chalkville, Eileen Slack became the superintendent of Winleton Youth Training Center in Australia, a position she held from 1978 to 1991. In 2015, allegations went public revealing that underage girls were sexually abused while under her care. Upon investigating, the Child Abuse Royal Commission discovered several additional unfortunate missteps carried out by Dr. Slack. If anything, this is indicative that the leadership at Chalkville had always been relatively poor. While the use of the Chalkville campus was being phased out by court order prior to the tornado, it had been suggested that the Alabama Department of Youth Services could reduce their population by 50 to 55 percent as early as 1989, when a study was conducted by Paul DeMero and Jeffrey Butts. They found that a large number of low-risk and highly needy youths are currently incarcerated at the Chalkville facility. The risk scores of youths at Chalkville were lower than youths currently committed to DYS group homes and the non-residential city programs. 87 percent of DYS females scored under 7 points on the risk assessment, yet most 61% are placed at Chalkville, a relatively expensive institutional program. The state must either dramatically increase its institutional capabilities at the cost of $30,000 per bed, or Alabama can adopt a more realistic approach to its problem of juvenile crime. Years of experience and national trends indicate that all troubled children do not need to be incarcerated. The state did not utilize this advice, and in the 90s and early 2000s, lawsuits began to pour in detailing horrific abuse allegations. There are several public court case documents pertaining to the Chalkville campus abuse allegation lawsuits. The details are extremely disturbing in nature, so viewer discretion is highly advised. This is from the factual summary section of Cyrita Muakil versus the Alabama Department of Youth Services. Plaintiff arrived at the Chalkville campus in June 1998. She alleges that various members of the DYS staff began to sexually abuse and harass her soon after her arrival. When the plaintiff first arrived at the Chalkville campus, she lived in Chickasaw Cottage where Terrence A.C. worked as a youth services aide. Plaintiff alleges that he began to sexually abuse and harass her around August 1998. She claims that he would come in there and bother her every morning, when he was supposed to be waking up the girls. Plaintiff testified that many times AC woke her up by pulling down her underwear and pulling the covers off of her. Plaintiff claims that AC also regularly harassed her while she was getting dressed. She testified, Sometimes I would already be awake before he'd come wake us up, or I would be getting dressed or in the middle of changing my clothes and he'd come in there and just tell me he wanted to see me naked, or if I was standing there already in my underwear, he would just tell me to go ahead and take off my underwear, or he would try to pull them down so he could see me naked and, How did you respond to him when he did this? I would cover myself up and tell him to get out of my room. Was there ever an instance where he actually had his hands on your underwear? Yes. What would you do when he actually had his hands on your underwear? I would push him off of me and I'd try to push him away from me. Plaintiff alleges that at least twice in her bedroom and once in the kitchen, AC pinned her down and pushed his fingers into her genitalia. During some of these incidents and on several separate occasions, Plaintiff claims that AC also grabbed her hand and put it down his pants onto his genitalia. Plaintiff testified that all of these alleged incidents occurred in the early morning and that most of them occurred in her bedroom in Chickasaw Cottage. 
Plaintiff claims that she pleaded with AC to leave her alone, but that he threatened that if she did not grab his genitalia or let him touch her genitalia, he would take away her privileges, throw away her mail, make sure she didn't get any passes, and report her as a suicide risk so that they would take away her clothes and her mattress. In late August 1998, Plaintiff told a Chickasaw Cottage staffer about AC's behavior. Shortly thereafter, James Caldwell, superintendent of the Chalkville campus, held a meeting with Plaintiff and several other girls who had also reported sexual harassment and or abuse by Chickasaw Cottage staff. Plaintiff testified that Caldwell asked her to tell him what happened, which she did. According to Plaintiff, Caldwell's response was to call AC on the speakerphone in the girl's presence to ask him about the girl's allegations. Plaintiff testified that AC denied the allegations and that then, when Caldwell informed AC that Plaintiff was in the room listening, AC began to talking to her directly. Plaintiff claims that AC told her she was lying and that the discussion eventually escalated into a verbal altercation to the extent that each was cursing at the other. Ultimately, Caldwell told the girls that he did not believe them and sent them back to their cottage. Plaintiff testified that after the meeting with Caldwell, AC continued to sexually harass her, though it wasn't as bad as before. Plaintiff claims that AC would still make sexually explicit comments like, I wanna fuck you in the ass and I want you to my dick and that he would brush up against her unnecessarily. Plaintiff wrote several letters to her mother in which she told her about the abuse and in October 1998, Plaintiff's mother went to the Chalkville campus and spoke with Caldwell about the sexual abuse her daughter was experiencing. After her mother's visit, the first action was taken as a result of Plaintiff's allegations. She was transferred to Cherokee Cottage. Plaintiff alleges that after she moved to Cherokee Cottage in the fall of 1998, a campus security guard named John Ziegler began to sexually abuse and harass her. Plaintiff claims that Ziegler used to joke on her butt all the time, and that he slapped her on the butt several times. Also, Plaintiff alleges that Ziegler grabbed her pelvic area several times, often while making these comments such as, I know it's wet down there. Other times, according to Plaintiff, Ziegler would grab her around the waist and grind his crotch into her while telling her that he was hard and that he wanted her to give him oral sex. Plaintiff also alleges that several times Ziegler grabbed her hand, put it down his pants, and told her to touch him to make him feel good. In addition, Plaintiff claims that Ziegler repeatedly threatened to tell the school principal, Jarrell Barbie, that Plaintiff was stealing if she did not masturbate him. While AC harassed Plaintiff only in the cottage environment, Plaintiff was usually at school or on her way to or from school when Ziegler harassed her. Plaintiff had special privileges at school by which she was allowed to stay after school to help clean, buff floors, plant flowers, and assist with other maintenance tasks. Plaintiff testified that she tried to stay out of Ziegler's way but that she stayed after school a good bit and that often Ziegler was the only other person around. Many of the alleged incidents of sexual harassment by Ziegler occurred while Plaintiff was in or around the school building doing her special chores often after school hours. Plaintiff even testified that there were times when Ziegler would pull her out of class for various reasons and then sexually harass her. Plaintiff eventually informed Christine Bennett, a teacher, and Stephanie Rosenall, a staff member, about Ziegler's actions. Shortly thereafter, in January 1999, Jarrell Barbie called Plaintiff into his office to discuss her allegations against Ziegler. Plaintiff testified that she told Barbie in detail the things that Ziegler had been doing to her, but that Barbie took Ziegler's side, made it evident that he didn't believe her allegations, yelled at her, and generally made her feel bad for reporting Ziegler's actions. Thereafter, although Barbie never explicitly told Plaintiff that her privileges would be revoked, Plaintiff claims that she was no longer allowed to stay after school to do special chores. Nevertheless, according to Plaintiff, Ziegler's behavior did not change after she complained to Barbie. She claims that he continued to make sexually explicit comments and to touch her in an inappropriate manner. Plaintiff did not report Ziegler to Barbie again. She was released from DYS custody on May 17, 1999. Out of morbid curiosity, I googled Cyrita Muakil, the plaintiff in the case I was just reading, to find details outlining the remainder of her life. After being released from Chalkville, she married two years later and had seven children. There are two mugshot photos, multiple social media photos, and an obituary. Cyrita Muakil died in March 2023. In another case, KM versus Alabama Department of Youth Services, Judge Myron Thompson concluded that minor plaintiff Tab suffered emotional distress so severe that no reasonable person could be expected to endure it. Where minor plaintiff as a result of sexual assault became much more emotional, cries much more than she did before the assault, for some time after the assault, which occurred around March 14th and 15th, would become hysterical around the 14th and 15th of each month, has been traumatized by the assault, has become a much more fearful person than she was before, 
before, and although she has been to see shrinks and stuff, visits with mental health experts only made her feel worse. She has produced evidence of such weight and quality that fair-minded persons in the impartial exercise of judgment could reasonably infer that she has suffered emotional distress so severe that no reasonable person could be expected to endure it. Nonetheless, Aseme, the alleged abuser slash defendant, responds that because TAB had serious mental health problems before the assault, any emotional distress she exhibited after the assault was merely a continuation of her earlier problems. Aseme contends that even if he did assault TAB, TAB cannot establish that her emotional distress was caused by the assault, and not caused by incidents that occurred before the assault. There is no doubt that TAB experienced great stress prior to her commitment to Chalkville, including the loss of many family members. A psychological evaluation given to TAB upon her entry to DYS stated that TAB has certainly experienced a great deal of trauma in her life and seems to have few skills for coping. She also appears to have very poor self-esteem and sees herself as having little value as a person. She seems to have been deprived of a healthy childhood and appears to have an inappropriate level of responsibility in the home and for her mother. Furthermore, the evaluation suggested that TAB may have a significant problem with depression. However, the fact that TAB entered Chalkville having already experienced a great deal of emotional trauma does not bar a reasonable jury from concluding that Aseme's acts caused TAB's mental health to deteriorate. Because there is no set limit to a person's capacity to be emotionally harmed, even if TAB was seriously depressed and emotionally traumatized before the incident, a jury could still find that Aseme's acts seriously exacerbated TAB's condition and therefore caused her extreme emotional distress. But more to the point, the reason DYS juvenile detainees are in DYS custody is not because they are well adjusted or otherwise mentally healthy, but rather because they suffer from emotional, social, and other mental health problems. Indeed, what particularly lifts this case into the realm of the outrageous is that allegedly, out of a carnal desire to satisfy his own pleasures and needs, SMA abused his state-conferred authority to take sexual advantage of a minor girl who he must have known was more than likely already severely emotionally damaged. Aseme's argument, which is essentially that because TAB was already emotionally damaged, it cannot be determined whether she was further emotionally damaged as a result of his alleged conduct, is therefore forcefully rejected by the court. Although the original lawsuit filed against the Alabama Department of Youth Services in 2002 was for $171 million, in 2007 the settlement came down to $12.5 million to be split among 49 plaintiffs. That is approximately $250,000 each. To endure extreme trauma in the form of a physical and psychological assault, the likes of which were described by an Alabama judge as so severe that no reasonable person could be expected to endure it. An excerpt from a 2002 article perfectly captures the ineptitude of the Department of Youth Services. DYS began investigating Chalkville employees after the allegations of sexual misconduct and abuse arose in May 2001. Regarding the girls' allegations, DYS spokesman Alan Peaton said, That's exactly the kind of thing we're investigating. From our perspective in the state office, there's not going to be a situation where they are not taken seriously. At the outset of the investigation, 12 male guards, teachers, and staffers were suspended with pay pending the outcome of the investigation. Eight of those employees were eventually fired, and 11 non-teaching staff members were set for termination hearings. The three remaining suspended workers, one aide and two guards, are being reinstated based on recommendations of the investigators. Kelly Kazek of AL.com wrote in August 2016 about the future of incorrigible girls in Alabama. After a series of court-ordered reforms, the Department of Youth Services was already phasing out the use of the Chalkville campus when the tornado struck. A new facility opened in 2015 to meet court mandates. The population that was previously enrolled at Chalkville is now placed at the J. Walter Wood Jr. Treatment Facility located in Mount Meigs. This facility was built using the insurance proceeds from the destroyed campus and is operated by Rite of Passage. Rite of Passage is a Nevada-based organization specializing in the operation of youth improvement facilities, which of course has been facing abuse charges itself since shortly after its inception over 35 years ago. We're recovering from injuries after a fiery riot at a juvenile rehabilitation camp in northern Nevada. Authorities say 10 juveniles escaped after someone set two buildings on fire Saturday night. The state fire marshal is handling the arson investigation while police look into the riot. This is the fourth uprising in as many months at the facility for at-risk teens. The privately run youth centers in Colorado take troubled kids that have been convicted of some pretty serious crimes. 
Well, now the state says that the kids were so unsafe at the Denier facility, it had no choice but to force the private company that was running it to close the doors. This time, the state said Rite of Passage wasn't truthful in reports about a kid that it claimed tried to attack a staff member. Well, when the state got video of the July 20th incident, that video showed the staff member pushed the kid, not the other way around. Then that staff member took the kid to the floor by the neck. Also this month, video showed a staff member physically grabbing a kid out of a chair after that kid threw trash. But before the video came out, Rite of Passage tried to say it was the youth who pushed the staff member first. Our investigation uncovered other problems in recent years at Denier, but also at a third facility that Rite of Passage operates just east of Aurora, Ridgeview. Here, a staff member punched a kid in the face. Another kid who was trying to walk away from the facility was hurt so badly by responding staff that he spent the next month in a wheelchair. That facility is still open. In 2015, AL.com published an article titled, New DYS Girls Facility Reflects Alabama's Reformed Approach to Juvenile Crime, showcasing the new facility which certainly looks like a jail cross with a school. The state of Alabama and the Department of Youth Services will continue to pretend that the state training school for girls in Chalkville never existed and it will ultimately go down in history as just another gigantic atrocity carried out by inept, underfunded Alabama state institutions. This is so easily accessible and unrestricted that it is practically a public park. There are probably thousands of people that have visited it since it has been abandoned judging by how many YouTube videos there are and the mass amounts of vandalism and graffiti. Although there was seemingly no hope for redevelopment of the site for more than a decade, an article was published in June 2023 claiming that the former Chalkville campus of the Department of Youth Services may spring back to life next year as a recreational facility for the city of Clay. City Manager Ronnie Dixon discussed the options for the property with the City Council during the Tuesday, June 27th meeting. It's going to be a really long-term deal. The Land Committee will make their recommendation in September, Dixon said. He said the Department of Youth Services Board would probably make a decision in December. The caveat is it will only be used for recreational purposes. It cannot be sold or developed for commercial, residential, or industrial use, Dixon added. He said youth services could choose to offer Clay a license to use the property or a long-term lease. The 500-plus acre site closed in 2012 after a tornado damaged or destroyed many of the buildings on campus. The property has since endured more than a decade of neglect and vandalism. We can talk about all kinds of different recreational developments that can go in there, Dixon said. One of the easiest things is going to be to put some tennis courts because they're already there. They just have to be recoded. Dixon said many of the remaining buildings would likely have to be removed, but the city would try to preserve some of the stone from the structures. He said it was unlikely that any of the buildings could be saved, including the chapel, which has fallen prey to vandalism and satanic graffiti throughout the building. The property also includes a lake, which could be maintained as another local fishing spot for the community. He did not say whether the city would try to preserve the historic clock in the administration tower on campus. The clock was originally located in the Jefferson County Courthouse in downtown Birmingham and was relocated to Chalkville when the courthouse was demolished. Um, it's funny that they include this point because obviously the clock in question is presumably long destroyed, considering that it has been missing from the administration building since shortly after the tornado. Speaking to the Trustville Tribune after the meeting, Dixon said the plans could include a golf driving range and disc golf courses among other recreational uses. He said he did not anticipate building any lodges or plans for any overnight uses. I'll end with a comment that was left on my website in June 2021. Yo, this is the most evil place they have made and that I have been into where I started cry as soon as I saw this MF fuck all the way up. Please parents, just listen to your child because the many nights I freaking suffered here and everything is true right down to the women who were bisexual and went down at night slash shower time and I'm sure this is not the only place I would like to think, but I know it's not. I'm 31 and fucking still suffer from nightmares from this shithole. It didn't reform anything but makes you feel less and ready for the big prison. If y'all could keep y'all kids away and out, I'm begging you, I can't put all I want on here, but just know I was once locked away, brainwashed, abused, all while in DYS services. Don't send your babies nowhere state has control. PTSD for the rest of my life.